Hello and welcome back to another edition of GNAT TV's In-Depth Series. I'm Andrew McKeever, the News Director at GNAT TV's News Project. It's a pleasure to have you with us today on Wednesday, July 20th. We're continuing our series of conversations with candidates who are running for statewide office around Vermont. And today it's our pleasure to have Patricia Preston, who is running in the Democratic Party's primary for Lieutenant Governor. She is the president and CEO of the nonprofit organization, Vermont Council on World Affairs. The council, in cooperation with the public and private sectors, promotes an awareness and understanding of the world and its people through public forums, hosting international visitors, and working with educational institutions, and is based up in Burlington, Vermont, although, of course, in the COVID era, they are virtually statewide. Ms. Preston, thank you very much for making the time for this conversation and welcome to the News Project. Well, thank you so much for having me today, Andrew, and thanks to everyone tuning in today. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. All right, well, uh, I guess the obvious starting point is uh, what prompted you to throw your hat into the ring this year for uh, the Lieutenant Governorship? That is the question of the hour, or half hour, I suppose. <laughs> So I, I decided to run for Lieutenant Governor because at a base, I love Vermont and I truly believe in the promise of this state. And I have been, as you mentioned, the president and CEO of the Vermont Council on World Affairs, which is a statewide organization for almost a decade now. And in that role, I have been traveling the state, meeting with Vermonters, hearing about the hope and success that they're facing, but I've also heard a lot about how folks are struggling. And when COVID-19 hit, every single struggle that I had heard about was exacerbated. And I said to myself that I didn't wanna wake up in another decade and know that I could have done something and that I was positioned to do something and that I didn't. And so I've put my my hat in the ring and have been running now for almost the last six months. Um, I guess I just wondered, um, what are some of the major issues that you're uh, emphasizing in your campaign? The three big things are climate change, affordability, and strengthening our rural communities. And if I can, I think that the reason why these are my three topics goes back a little bit to who I am and where I come from. If I can kind of pivot there for a second and then come back to these priorities. I've been running this organization for the last decade, but I'm from Randolph Center. I'm from Orange County, Vermont, and I grew up there on a dairy farm. It's a fourth generation dairy farm that's still in operation today. And so when I talk about strengthening our rural communities, I'm thinking about the agricultural community, right? And I'm from Randolph Center, my husband is from Barrie, and we go back home to both places very often. And I'm seeing what's happening in these different communities. And that's part of it, just even outside of my work, it's going home and seeing people in some of these communities being left behind in the progress and prosperity that everyone in this state deserves. I also attended if anyone, and I don't know if you've been to Randolph Center before, but across from VTC, there's a little red schoolhouse. Have you seen that before? I've the, been to Randolph and I've been to VTC. Uh, I don't recall the schoolhouse, but it, maybe it's, it's there. <laughs> it might be so small you missed it. <laughs> but I, that's where I attended elementary school. And it's uh, the same elementary school that my grandparents went to and my dad went to and my sisters went to. It's, it's even one of the schools where inside there's a big rope bells. And so for recess, it took five of, you know, me and my classmates jumping up and down on the rope to ring the bell for everyone to come in. That's where I grew up. That's where I went to school. And I think that it's important to also acknowledge that because I think it gives people an understanding of where I come from and the kind of leader I'm going to be in Montpelier is someone who understands a lot of the deep roots around this state and the struggles that rural communities face. But I also went on to UVM, got my teaching degree, and then worked around the world in over 45 countries with, with youth and in nonprofits, and then came back and reinvested in this state. And so when you think about who's gonna be fighting for climate action and affordability and rural communities, I want people to understand who I am at a core and who's gonna be fighting in these areas. Okay, well, let's uh, drill down a little bit then into some of those issues that you just mentioned there. Uh, we can start with affordability. Uh, I, I guess uh, I was on your campaign's website, and I, I see that you mentioned that there. And uh, But how will we go about uh, 
alleviating those cost pressures on, on average Vermonters? Yeah, so I mean, when we talk about housing, I recently saw an article in seven days that called affordable housing in Chittenden County a half a million dollars. And so we need to figure out a way as a state to use the unprecedented amount of funds coming into our state right now to tackle this crisis. So that's a few things. One, that's making sure we modernize Act 250. Another thing is to make sure that we have workforce that's able to, to build sustainable housing, ideally, weatherization, all of the things that can go along with a sustainable building plan. And also, we need to invest these dollars into our, our water, uh, into our wastewater and sewer systems. So a lot of the towns, even if we want to build or grow in certain areas, can't because our infrastructure can't handle having such a high influx of folks there. So these are some of the, the basic things that we need to address when it comes to housing. When it comes to child care, it would be my recommendation that there is state support or potentially even an employer tax that will help go to support our early childhood education. Our children are our future. And in COVID, when I talked earlier about how all of our issues were exacerbated, women were disproportionately taken out of the workforce when COVID-19 hit. And men were taken out too, of course, but women disproportionately to be the, the primary caregiver and are not able to go back into the workforce because they cannot find child care. Um, if we think about any industry, we're struggling to have workforce here, right? We're struggling to get folks here, but we also aren't making it accommodating for housing or for childcare. I was recently at a hospital in central Vermont that one of their perks is that, you know, or one of their draws to come work there is that they provide childcare in a building next to the hospital. When I was there, they said that there is a wait list for three years they're totally full and cannot offer that to new employees coming in. And they can't attract new talent to work at this hospital because they can't provide child care. And it just makes it untenable for families to live here. And I'm one of the folks that I, I, I went to school here. Like I said, I went to UVM. I went to Blue Ridge Schoolhouse. I left Vermont. And it was a hard choice to come back, right? We have the brain drain from the state. We have people coming here, getting educated or, or growing up here and then leaving. And it's really hard to come back because of these uh, things that are prohibiting us from, from economic opportunity, from housing, from child care. And for me, it is a priority as Lieutenant Governor to sound the alarms, raise the flag, make this a top priority for everyone in the state so that we can be more um, of economically viable and accommodating place for people to actually come and work or the folks that are here get jobs. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I understood one thing you said there. You you, uh, you mentioned that in order to provide, I think I understood this correctly, uh, more child care opportunities and better salaries for the workers, that would be financed through an employer tax? Oh, I did say that very quickly. I think that there are a lot of options, right? There are a lot of options. One of the, some of the, but I, I guess what I was trying to say is um, I think a lot of times people think that, um, you know, we have this funding coming in from the state right now, right? And and people say, oh, well, this can go to childcare, but it's a one-time, one-stop shop for this funding. So how do we make this sustainable? And I think that there are ways to work with employers to figure out what a, um, what a reasonable tax might be to, to give uh, child care to their employees or a tax in the state so that the state can help find affordable and high quality child care. So that's one of many, many solutions that could be a part of it. But I happen to be a fan of Let's Grow Kids and Let's Grow Kids has supported a lot of uh, policies that I happen to be supportive of. Um, and that's, that's one of them. Um, I also wanted to ask you about Act 250 reform. That was on my on my list here, and you mentioned that in the course of your earlier answer. Uh, so uh, when we say Act 250 reform or modernizing Act 250, what specifically does that does that mean? So modernizing Act 250 will help us build houses in our historic downtowns because we cannot get people into these jobs because there's no housing, right? Um, and 
that's just one solution. Let me give, let me give you um, an example of the modernizing of Act 250, very concrete. I was in Stowe the other day and I was stopped at a business on Mountain Road, um, headed up, up the hill towards uh, Smuggler's Notch. I stopped at a business and I was chatting with them and they can't find any workforce. They can't get anybody to move here because Stowe also, Stowe had an incredible amount of people move in from out of town and take all of the housing. They can't get anyone to work for them because they can't get housing. So they had a building next to their facility and business and they showed it to me, they pointed to, to it and they said, do you see this here? And I said, yeah, this, this can be renovated for a six apartment complex, but we cannot get it passed because of Act 250. And I said, all right, well, what's the holdup on this? And they said, this very specific kind of tree, because if you know Stowe and a mountain road, there's a river that runs along the road up to the mountain. And they said, because it's near this river, we need to plant a very specific kind of tree on the riverbed. And, and these trees on the other side of the riverbed had grown up very tall. And she pointed to me and I could see, and she said, so we have not been able to get this tree to survive along the riverbed. And because we can't plant it, and because it's, there's no flexibility here, we cannot renovate this housing because there's a requirement for this tree to be here. That's one example of needing to modernize Act 250. I mean, and I think that there are hundreds of these little micro examples throughout Act 250 um, that it's prohibiting people to, to be able to build homes that are necessary for the workforce. And I think Act 250, I wanna be very clear. I, I mean, I grew up on a farm, I grew up on a lot of land. I love our landscapes. I love our agricultural communities. I love the face of Vermont and I don't wanna change that, right? but we also have climate migrants coming. We have a workforce issue. We have a lot of issues that we need to solve. And I wanna be ahead of it, not behind it. And I wanna be proactive in thinking, how can we create a Vermont that is, a, that is able to hold the space for the folks that are here looking for housing? Which yeah. is something I, I also, that's a good little segue perhaps to, uh, I just wanted to find out a little bit more about your thoughts on, on climate change on this very warm day down here. What 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 was your feeling about the clean heat standard, and uh, what should be done to make that transition from fossil fuels to cleaner ener clean energy sources uh, doable, without imposing you know an enormous amount of strain on the economy as it is today? So I'll say this: is you know we know that heating Vermont's buildings produces more than a third of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. And so, of course, I think that we should take any action that we can to move forward to a more green economy. I also think that we need to make sure that Vermonters aren't being left behind in this process and that it's actually tenable and that they're able to uh, meet the goals in a way that's realistic. And so I would support any policy that is moving us forward in the direction to a more sustainable uh, a sustainable Vermont using and, and, and moving in a green uh, in the way of a green economy um, that brings Vermonters along in the process. And that for me, when I talk about the role of Lieutenant Governor, I largely see the role in this office. I mean, outside of, we all know that the two primary functions to step in for the governor if need be and to preside over the Senate. Um, outside of that, I think an integral role of the Lieutenant Governor is to really be someone who can hold forums and conversations and roundtables with you. Know, so for example, I was at um, Resilient Vermont in Norwich, Vermont the other day. I was actually speaking at that conference. And when I was there, there was people from every renewable sector. And everyone sort of said, this is why this one's the best and this one's the best and this one's the best. So even people that are all on the same side of renewables are amazing, have different perspectives on how we address these issues. And for me, I think the role that the Lieutenant Governor can play is holding forums like that and bringing everyday Vermonters in and really creating a platform for people to express their concerns or say, I don't know if this is affordable. What is an incentive that might be here to help me get there to become more, um, uh, to, to create a more carbon neutral Vermont. And so that's the role that I want to play in that. And I obviously think that uh, the clean heat standard was a, a good, a good bill. Um, although I understand that I think that some Vermonters felt their voice was left out of the conversation, the transition, and it would be my goal to make sure that those two things came together. 
Right. Uh, yeah, very complicated issue. Uh, and um, of course, we're we're seeing it play out in a very interesting way, I think, with the price of gas being what it is, uh, which in theory, I, I would have thought would have been an incentive to move forward and double down on things like electric vehicles or other renewable energy. But uh, we seem to be kind of stuck uh, at the moment. Um, well, you- well, I was just going to say on electric vehicles, I mean, I think electric vehicles are a great solution, right? And they're part of the solution. But in everything, whether it's solar or wind or weatherization or electric vehicles, it also has to be what's our public transportation system, right? What, how are we making sure that we're looking at everything holistically? Because each piece plays a part. It's not like we're just going to use wind and that will create a solution for us and suddenly we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll have met our 2030 goals. I think we need to look at each piece of this. Um, and, and it also goes back to when I say I, I talk about climate action, that goes back to building a green economy and supporting our rural communities. So I, I recently met with some folks from the organization Resource. Have, have you heard of them before? I don't think so, no. So they have, they, they uh, you know, they don't actually have a home base. They, they rent or get free space from folks, but they essentially are jobs training program where they teach folks about carpentry, weatherization, solar installation, and it's people of all ages, all backgrounds, and they, they're, it's jobs training. It's amazing. They're amazing. And I think that they're the future. And they would be one of the organizations that I build up and promote because they're both working towards a green economy. And they're also saying, how do we get jobs to Vermonters across the state, in particular in our rural communities that sometimes are left behind in a lot of these conversations? How do we get these folks these jobs, get them the training? And and they also, they're amazing. I could go on about them forever. I won't. But they also hold career fairs and bring people in to have. So at the end of their training, they're actually partnered and introduced to uh, folks in the industry. And that's the kind of model I think that is important as Lieutenant Governor that I'm amplifying, elevating, and making sure Vermonters understand that that's an option. Okay, let me let me move on then to, you mentioned the agricultural sector and uh, that you'd grown up on a farm and all of that. Uh, the Vermont's dairy uh, sector in particular has been struggling a lot for a long time. Uh, do you see a pathway out of that? Um, how prices for milk could be increase to the point where it makes some of those farms more, you know, economically sustainable? This is probably the hardest, I've never been asked this, and this is maybe the hardest question I've ever been asked because I simultaneously want to have hope and I feel devastated about this. Um, no, I, I think, you know, so for example, there was the bill, uh, the $1.5 trillion in appropriate appropriations in the, the omnibus bill, where uh, I think it was something where maybe 17 million was set aside by Leahy um, to go toward, I think it was around 75, oh, no, no, uh, sorry, it was $10 million uh, to go to the University of Vermont to really establish partnerships and partnerships with dairy and uh, uh, with dairy farms around the state. So I think that there's hope. I think there's people that understand it and people that are trying to put money into it to build these partnerships. But at the same time, when I go home or I travel across the state and I go to dairy farms, that's not the story that's told on the farm. And so while I know the numbers and I know the data and I know what's there, um, I don't I don't personally see farms getting the support that they need. And I think that, um, we need to have a multi-pronged approach to this. How are we bringing tech to farmers? How are we, you know, because I, I see your face there. So, so like the tech, um, there's a lot of new dairy tech that's coming <laughs> out that would help support farmers so that they actually, because workforce is hard everywhere, right? Especially when you're on a dairy farm, but all this new tech is being introduced into the egg sector to uh, work with cows, to do the milking and have it all be very, um, uh, computerized in a lot of ways. I think there's solutions there. I think that there's solutions with, um, you know, environmental practices and integrating them onto farms, but farmers aren't really receiving enough of that, I don't think, even though the money and funding's there. So, so for me, there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between the will of the state, the funding I see going out, and what's happening when I actually get onto dairy farms across the state. You know, you mentioned uh, helping rural communities uh, stay competitive. Uh, 
and that's uh, that's a subject I've I've been kind of following a bit myself to to try to just figure out. You know, I mean, I guess it's sort of a, you could look at it as a national issue as well. I mean, you could look at rural states across the country struggling to compete with uh, ones that are more have more large urban centers, and of course, here in Vermont, the contrast is usually between Chittenden County and the rest of the state. Um, I mean, one of the solutions that's often been uh, touted for uh, helping smaller towns and smaller cities uh, compete and attract uh, more businesses and jobs is broadband. And I know we have the Communication Union District uh, framework set up and moving forward and a lot of ARPA funding going into broadband. Do you feel like that's happening fast enough? Uh, I mean, because I'm thinking you mentioned the farms there a moment ago, and there was certainly a sector that could use high-speed broadband that would seem to be one. Yeah, 100%. And the fastest answer to that is no, it's not happening fast enough. You know, when I first started to run, I actually... Um, I heard a lot about another, a former candidate who ran for governor a while ago, um, who many people know, um, Matt Dunn. And he, you know, that was almost 10 years ago and his big thing was broadband. And then I know, you know, when Molly Gray ran, I know she talked a lot about broadband. And I know a lot of people have cared for a very long time about making sure that broadband is, is uh, successful and we're still not there yet and it's not fast enough. So I, you know, we need to ensure that children can be connected to the internet, whether they're at home or at school. I, um, I talked to a young woman at uh, the high school in Colchester and she told me that when COVID hit, her parents and her would go to and then sit outside in uh, uh, sit outside of McDonald's. And this is in Colchester. This isn't even a super rural area. Colchester, Vermont. They went and sat outside of McDonald's, and both of her parents ran their businesses from the front seat, and she went to school in the back seat. And I said, "This is not okay to be happening in 2022 in our state. We this is clearly not fast enough. And quite frankly, it's a human rights issue. When COVID hit." and people could not go outside and had to access healthcare through telehealth. And they could not do that around a large portion of this state. It is not okay and it's not fast enough. So I, as Lieutenant Governor, will support programs that make broadband installation and affordable uh, and services affordable to Vermonters and to families um, around the state and also um, would encourage anything that would help the broadband build out move faster be easier and of course affordable and i'm assuming this is also part of the whole idea of how we attract or retain younger folks to move to the state or stay in the state uh, too clearly that's that's a major element in that yeah i mean i left for economic opportunity right and i was able to come back and that was a big investment but we have a moment in time where people can be here and live here and work remote, but they can't do it if we don't have broadband and they can't access jobs in other uh, larger cities and still stay here and live here um, if we don't have broadband around the state. I just wanted to ask you about another question I've, I've ran by just about every other candidate I've spoken to, and that's of uh, course grows out of the uh, uh, somewhat unfortunate round of current events we've been hearing about lately uh, involving uh, mass shootings uh, and gun safety. Do you feel the state is at a point where our gun safety rules and regulations are adequate, or are there some areas that we could uh, see some improvement uh, where it would just be some common sense rules that you know would just simply improve our chances that something like what we saw in, in Buffalo or Uvalde or Highland Park wouldn't happen here? Yeah, so a few things on that. First of all, I grew up on a farm. I grew up around hunters. I understand what responsible safe gun ownership looks like, and I support that, right? But another thing happened. When I was at that same school in Colchester, I was sitting there with someone on my campaign staff. And when we walked out of that building, she said to me, that was really hard. And I thought to myself, oh, did a student say something or, you know, did something bad happen on the campaign trail? And she said, no, it was just stressful. And I said, oh, did it remind you of your days in high school and you were stressed? I, I couldn't, you know, I was so focused on what I, the, the meeting we had. She said, Trisha, she said, every footstep I heard coming down the hall, she said, I just clenched not knowing, right? 
I didn't know if someone had a gun. And she said, that's what I now associate with school. She said, I'm truly petrified to go in there. And I don't know if I want to go back um, into another school. There's also been instances where, you know, I said at one of my debates, I said, um, uh, that I agreed with banning assault weapons with high capacity magazines. And then I received a, a barrage of messages about that that feel very threatening. And to me, it's like one of those things where um, what's scary is there aren't enough regulations and to have those messages or to know what happens in schools, it, it is overwhelming. Am I, my college roommate was a student teacher in Essex during the school shootings, and I'm the one who held her after those shootings. You know, th this is very real, and it does happen here, and we're not immune. So for me, I think some really basic things like closing the Charleston loophole to ensure gu a gun cannot be sold to a dangerous in individual because of a delayed background check or banning assault weapons with high capacity magazines are just some things that are really easy to do that still allow space for responsible gun ownership. And I, I always say, I said, it should not be harder for a woman to get birth control than it is for someone to get a gun. And right now it is harder for a woman to get birth control than it is for someone to get a gun. And that doesn't seem right to me. I, I just wanted to kind of finish up with one kind of, uh, I guess, uh, philosophical question, which will be yeah. impossible to answer in a minute or two, but uh, I'll, I'll throw it your way anyway. Okay. Because um, one of the things I've, I've, and everybody else I'm sure has been noticing, is is the polarization and, and sort of division and cultural warfare that seems to be underway well, across the entire country, I guess, but uh, uh, maybe less so here in Vermont, but we're having our share of that. Um, I guess I just wondered, uh, do you see the role of Lieutenant Governor as one where part of your job uh, is to try and talk to both sides of the ide ideological fence and you know, try to encourage compromises and working together instead of uh, screaming at each other on Facebook or something? Not only is it the job of Lieutenant Governor, it is part of why I am running, and it is largely why I am uniquely qualified for this position. The Vermont Council on World Affairs is an apolitical nonpartisan organization. And for the last decade, I have been bringing people together from all around this world, this country, and this state, from every different political party, to sit around small round tables, to come to hundred, multiple, you know, hundreds of people in, a, in an event space, to sit around a table, look at Vermont's most pressing issues and use consensus building to take steps forward in progress so that we can live in a more prosperous and peaceful world. That is what I do. That is what I've been doing for 10 years. And when you know folks say to me, oh, well, you don't have that legislative experience. I say, no, I don't have that. But what I do have is better, right? Or at least different, right? I don't know if one's better or the other, but it's different and it is uniquely qualifying for this position because I think that it is a vital role to play in, in, in the role of Lieutenant Governor. And I can use that civil discourse, I can use those conversations and then support the Senate in passing policy that is reflective of those conversations and bringing people together to have them. It's what I've done for 10 years and it's what I'll do as Lieutenant Governor. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're gonna have to leave it there for today, uh, Ms. Preston. I really, again, appreciate you taking the time to talk with us and share your views on these issues. Uh, and, uh, well, perhaps we'll have another opportunity to continue this conversation after the August 9th primary. Yes, I hope so. I look forward to it. <laughs> Coming up very quickly all of a sudden. Of course, early voting's already underway. So, uh, indeed. Well, uh, thanks again, Ms. Preston, th and uh, thanks to all of you who've been watching. I, I hope you found our program interesting, and, uh, well, we'll see you again the next time. And thanks for being with us. Mm -hmm.